my work on Tangled the series or DC Superhero Girls. And you will eventually see my work on Onyx Equinox and Amphibia. And currently I'm a story artist at Skydance Animation, working in some features and some of the stuff they have going on over there. Um, so I basically, uh, this, this whole little presentation sort of came up one day when um, John Lasseter and Heather Fangyanu were over checking out our very, very early like development work on the movie that I was working on at the time. And uh, John was kind of looking at our stuff and he was talking about, you know, the other, the other movies we had going on. He said, you know, we've been like looking a lot lately at a lot of the movies that have been coming out like in the last decade or so. And we've been noticing that like a lot of the characters look the same. Not even just, you know, hair color, eye color. It's just like, like all their faces are the same. And I said, oh, you mean like, like Linguini face? <laughs> because at the time, this was like when both Spies in Disguise and uh, Onward were coming out. And uh, as a lot of people who are on Twitter a lot know, everybody's like, every animation guy has this face. And it's like the, you know, the one, it's Linguini face. Anyway, Heather and John were both like, what? I've never heard of that. <laughs> so... Um, I compiled this little research project and uh, it was really well received over at Skydance. So I gave it to um, John and Heather and the other leadership there. And I also gave it to the entire studio and now I'm giving it to you. So uh, I hope you get something out of it. Um, I think uh, if you have any questions, just throw them in the chat. I want this to be really like conversational. So um, uh, is it is it Matt that's here? Um, yeah, that's me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Feel free to like interrupt me at any time. Uh, we can be super casual, um, and I'll answer as we go. So let's just jump into it. I'm gonna move my Zoom screen and then do this thing here. Cool. All right. Observations on modern character design. You guys can see that, right? It's the typical Zoom thing. Yeah, we see it. See that? Okay, rad. Uh, right, so uh, I kind of told you the backstory on this already. Um, so my, my research going into this was that uh, mostly growing up online, kind of reading all of the animation discourse and the think pieces and, and everything, I, I kind of had an idea of what people were missing and what people wanted to see through through animation. Um, so what I did was I went on Twitter um, and I posted this and I said, a question, what are some character design tropes that bother you in animation, specifically with humans? What are some design things that you wanna see more of or existing things that you like? I'm putting together a presentation at work and I wanna hear lots of perspectives. So I got, 473 replies, and uh, as of when I took the screen cap. <laughs> and here is what was said. Oh, so before I start, I wanted to put some guidelines up here. So this is kind of like where I, I um, sort of put my boundaries for what this was going to include. And that was that this is gonna be strictly design related. So it's going to be just what characters look like and kind of what that says about them and not so much like, you know, how is this character represented or how is, you know, it's not about gender sexuality. It's, it's all about specifically, you know, design uh, or at least I tried to keep it that way. Um, it's all media from between the year 2000 and the year 2020, uh, at least February, 2020, uh, things have come out since then. Um, it is specifically 3D feature animation from American studios and only theatrical releases. So we're not going to have TV animation. We're not going to have European or Japanese animation. Um, it's I just tried to really stick to 3D feature animation. And I put some video game stuff in there, but that's kind of just like as an example of like things that people do like to see. Um, moving on. All right, some notes. So most of my followers on Twitter who responded to this were teenagers, millennials, and animation professionals. So this isn't coming from like little kids. 
um, who are, you know, watching cartoons on Saturday morning or anything. So, um, and most of the other animation professionals kind of have an idea of like what I'm talking about here. Um, and also I'm going into this thinking that uh, animation is a medium and not a genre, which is to say that I don't consider animation to be like a children's medium, but I think most of what we watch when we are children is animation. And I think that that is kind of the things that we watch when we're kids sort of paint a picture of how we see the world. So if you hear me reference like, you know, children are seeing this and, and it's making them think this, like that's what I'm talking about. It's not necessarily that all animation is for children. Um, and I took every comment into consideration, uh, excluding some of the ones that were like, I got a lot of uh, comments that were, that seemed pretty exclusive, exclusive excuse me, to like video games. Um, and I tried to really stick with animation. And <laughs> this is a big one because when I presented this to Skydance, I was presenting it to people who a lot of them worked on the movies that I'm about to talk about. So these are, are not necessarily like saying like, this is bad. It's not a criticism. It's an observation. And it's sort of a big picture thing, not just kind of pinpointing, you know, a couple movies. Okay. So how I did this was I took all of the comments that I received and I began to tally the things that I saw multiple times. So the number one thing I feel like, the number one group of things that I noticed was people wanting more diversity in characters' faces. And that, I actually didn't expect that to happen. I thought it was gonna be more like, you know, more body types, more, you know, racial representation. It was 100% mostly people saying that we need more, a variety of like faces. Um, so Twitter user Chili's Chili said, I think creators are often afraid to make the main character or leads look too weird. I think following the same tropes for every character gets stale and hard to remember. For example, almost every white boy has the same short bubbly brown hair. Weird is memorable. And I kept thinking like weird is memorable, memorable is so, I don't know, that's such a good, good thing to think about because like we have a lot of, there, there is like a sort of subset of animation that's like ugly on purpose. And I feel like people associate that with like the weird looking characters, but I feel like there's a way to exaggerate features that are not like conventionally attractive and still make them appealing in that sort of classical animation way. Anyway, so. Uh, the highest instances of things that we saw were the linguini face, which we're about to find out what that is, if you don't already know. Uh, noses um, was spoken about at least 17 times, and faces in general, there were 28 instances. I hate to interrupt, but I think this is kind of funny because the first question is asking about same face syndrome. Yes, <laughs> we'll be seeing a lot of that. Um, that was a big, big thing happening. Uh, in this thread. Uh, what is this question specifically? Is it just kind of like, are we going to talk about? It's just general tips for how to avoid it. General tips. Okay. Another thing that I should have put in my uh, sort of disclaimers is that I'm not a character designer. So this is like, I'm not trying to tell anybody how to do their job. It's kind of just like, I'm observing these things from the outside. Um, I am not, I feel like personally, I don't have the technical skills to do a lot of the, the things that I'm talking about. But at the end, I have a lot of artists that I really admire that can do that. So we'll we'll check that out at the at the very end. Um, but uh, yeah, please don't think I'm a hack uh, because I'm not a character designer. <laughs> um, anyway, let's get through this. So this is the Linguini face <laughs> that everybody was talking about. And that's sort of the phenomenon that Tons of male characters have a face very similar to Linguini from Ratatouille, uh, which came out in 2007. Uh, we have two of these characters voiced by Tom Holland. Uh, <laughs> they all have this kind of messy-ish hair, uh, the big nose, the crooked teeth. He's kind of awkward. He's like skinny. He's our like modern day everyman. So he's like not threateningly masculine, but still not like, you know, he's not fat, he's not like feminine, he's not any of those things that we still sort of consider as a society to be like, 
negative, I guess. Um, but there's actually a lot more of this sort of facial type and body type than this. I almost put hiccup in here, but I'm really biased because I really like how to train your dragon. <laughs> but uh, he definitely fits the mold. Um, but yeah, we have, have Alfredo Linguini, we have Ian Lightfoot from Onward, Walter Beckett from Spies in Disguise, both of those came out around the same time, Arthur Claus from Arthur Christmas, Flint Lockwood from Clyde with a Chance of Meatballs, and George from Paper Man, and they're all kind of like spread out throughout the, the decade. Um, so that's that. All right, here's some more tweets from that I found pretty compelling. Uh, Speak of Lily says, super tiny noses, how do they breathe? Also, I love Disney's bug-eyed princesses look for their uh, look for their more modern movies, but it's weird that the women always have it and the men never do. Uh, Haley Rose says, guy characters who have really cool and interesting noses and all the girl characters have the same small button noses. And then Farragon Art said, small button noses slash chins and thin brows on women. As a person with an arched nose bridge and thick brows, it irks me. Also, not a fan of body types, always being directly assigned to personalities. I love when I see unique facial features. And there's a lot of interesting things in that last one. Um, so the nose thing, I had seen this before, kind of, on the internet. So if you have seen this image before, you probably know what comes after it. It's something where somebody took all of these male protagonists and trace their noses and then put them next to the, the female protagonists. But I went ahead and I like, I traced the entire silhouette of the face, the nose, the mouth and the eyes, and they look like this. So right away we see a pretty big variety of facial features. We have a lot of big noses. We have a lot of long faces. We have some short faces. We have faces where, you know, all of the features are right in the middle. We have a, uh, where they're all kind of towards the top. We have them all spread out. It's it's just a pretty big variety of, of shapes and and you know they're they're kind of recognizable as characters even even with this little information. So this image is uh, the female counterparts from a lot of the movies that we saw in the previous image. And I did the same thing with this one and we had <laughs> a lot of very round faces, a lot of little button noses. I tell people like I had a trouble with this one, finding out where to put the lines for the noses on a lot of these characters because they weren't as well defined. You know, sometimes we just get like a couple of nostrils or like a really sort of subtle curve. Um, so this was really eye-opening because I guess I, I never really, I had thought about it. I was kind of like in high school, kind of a, thought same face syndrome was like, oh, that's just like the Disney style. Everybody does that. But then when I looked at the male characters and they were so different, I was like, okay, maybe there's definitely something to this. Because when you put them together, it's pretty obvious, at least to me, that that there's a lot more sort of variety in male facial, facial features. And um, even when, you know, you have a lot of characters like dads, like top left is Merida's dad. Um, and even when you have mothers, which you'll see in some some slides coming up, uh, they all really have the same sort of look as as the princesses themselves. So <laughs> this was a fun exercise that I did. I don't know if anybody can directly answer uh, over Zoom, but uh, I asked everybody to be like, OK, can you identify all of these characters? And a lot of people could, like, if anybody was able to identify them all based on this, it would be a, an animation audience. So it's possible. I don't know. Um, does anyone want to go for it? Is that possible? <laughs> no? Matt? Yeah, I'll try. All right. Yeah. Let's see. We got Rapunzel. Okay. Uh, Anna from Frozen. Okay. Uh, oh, Hero's aunt, Cass. Wow. Okay. Uh, going down, we have Zed Elsa. Yes. And then Anna and Elsa's mom. Nice. And is that uh, Honey Lemon? Yeah, well, you got all of them right. That's amazing. <laughs> I am an animation fan, to be fair. <laughs> okay, well, you did great. Um, yeah, I feel like, I feel like, uh, you know, I don't want to, some of the people who, who worked on all of these movies couldn't tell when I gave this to the Skydance people. But yeah, it's... Um, Rapunzel, Anna, Aunt Cass, Honey Lemon, Anna and Elsa's mom, and Elsa. 
and like yes they do have you know differences in their facial features but i think what what scared me the most is that two of these characters are like mothers or mother figures and um i don't know like i don't totally get that just from looking at their faces um but yeah they're all cute it's it's fine um so here's the the famous sort of splicing of anna elsa and their mom together now they are all related so like that's just my totally um, unbiased opinion is that yes they are all related but i don't look enough like my sister and my mom to make a perfect sort of cross section of our faces and have us make like a coherent face i feel like um i don't know there's a lot in here i feel like it's not i, I don't know i have a hard time with this one um but i try to to sort of put it all on the table here um i think that what gets me is that there's going to be a picture later on of anna and elsa and their mom and their dad all together and like neither Anna or Elsa, like they don't have their dad's nose or his like facial structure. It's just, you know, they could they could push it a little maybe. All right, so moving on. Steven, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. I'm sorry, Steven, said, uh, I think a lot of stuff tends to be to shy away from distinct features for protagonists if they aren't considered considered conventionally attractive features which I think is a mistake aesthetically as well as ethically. A lot of kids only see their own features accentuated negatively. So I guess I'm just advocating for protagonists with more interesting faces and shapes rather than what we've all come to expect. And I think that's really important. Um, a lot of people do have like interesting, weird facial proportions, facial features, you know, big noses, whatever, whatever. Uh, and, and, you know, a lot of those features tend to be either like comic relief or parents or villains and um i don't know i feel like you can make easily make a protagonist that looks a little different from the rest of them and have it still be ap appealing and relatable so the second like biggest group of things uh with body diversity which i kind of expected to happen um and the top three sort of repeated phrases were variation as in like, you know, all of the characters sort of have a very similar body type. We have Fat Oaf, which is an archetype, which personally I see more in TV animation, I feel like, than, than feature. Um, but that's kind of like the comic relief guy who's like his entire shtick is that he's fat and it's funny. Uh, it's kind of tired, in my opinion, uh, and kind of offensive. And then disability uh, with seven instances. So. Celine said, I'd love to see a protagonist, male or female, who is chubby, not skinny, not overweight, but somewhat in the middle. And then Jordan said, I have noticed that either a protagonist is skinny or athletic or either fat or grotesquely fat, never just chubby or even biker build, chubby and muscular. Now I can see why if the hero has to has to be an athletic style fighter but what if he's a smart guy or a mage and i'm like that totally makes sense because i feel like most people are kind of in the not super skinny not super fat just kind of you know average looking build um so next up we have some really interesting preliminary designs by annette marnot um in from the movie storks so this was tulip the main character and like when i saw these like concepts I fell absolutely in love with them they're so cute um she's again she's super normal I think what got me about these is that I feel like when people are designing you know thick quote unquote female characters their their hips are always wider than their shoulders because that's kind of like a, a sort of feminine I guess shape the, the sort of hourglass figure that we go for, but you know, not everybody's built the same. Um, and you know, she has narrower hips than, than shoulders and she still looks very feminine to me. Um, so there's a couple more of these. Here's a, like an even bigger version of Tulip. And I think she's just like, she has so much energy and so much like personality that I don't know it just it just hurts me that we can't see a protagonist like this because she just i don't know she just looks like fun to be around um 
uh, and she's all those fun shapes and she just looks she just looks like a nice girl I don't know um, here's some more tulips this is kind of a take on the the first one we have different sort of frizzy curly hair um, she doesn't have a defined jawline which I don't know I find it I find it pretty cute and then here we have she has like kind of this gummy smile she just looks so interesting to me um, but I can easily see this character, you know, animated in sort of a 3D, typical sort of animated film style. And like, I wouldn't think twice about it. It's just, it just looks nice. I don't know. So this is Tulip how she came out. Um, she is, <laughs> she's a little bit like the female version of Linguini face. Um, she has the the button nose and the the same facial proportions as all the other female characters we looked at before she's like awkwardly skinny um she's still wearing the same outfit as she was before um you know this movie was was pretty cute but uh i i was kind of disappointed when i saw all of the the concepts for for tulip and how she came out on that and I feel like body diversity um, and kind of like all of this stuff is just as important for boys as it is for girls because, you know, if every character either looks like Linguini or Captain America, there's a lot of, of sort of types that, that we don't hit. And so Walter from Spies in Disguise, this is the, one of the Tom Holland characters, uh, I guess started out with BJ Crawford's art being sort of a like I feel like I know this guy I don't know he just looks like somebody you know he's a computer nerd you know he's not quite all the way put together his shirt's sticking out of the bottom um he's just kind of fun and this one is actually my absolute favorite I feel like he's very he looks like a very sweet sort of gentle dude and uh he's still he's still a little bit bigger and he still looks like he has a lot of personality he still has those freckles and those crooked teeth um, I don't know. So those are some more interesting designs. And this is how Walter ended up looking. Um, Linguini face again, he kind of looks like Tom Holland, I guess, which uh, I think that, you know, after you cast the character, you kind of, I don't know, I haven't been a feature for that long, you kind of want to make them look a little bit like the actor so you can like mimic some of those um, mannerisms. But uh, I think, and we'll, we'll probably we'll revisit this character later on a different um, a different bit but all of his clothes are so like clean and new looking and they don't really have any any I mean you find out in the movie that he is pretty clean and and sort of straightforward but they don't really say much about the character to me um but yeah so <laughs> kind of deviating from that on the left is a character from spies in disguise and on the right is tulip from storks and these are different studios and different characters and they look like almost exactly the same uh so yeah, yeah i started to interrupt a correction that has to be the same character yeah <laughs> i know i wish but uh yeah that's uh not the same character shockingly maybe they borrowed the model i'm not sure <laughs> but um right right and here's some like preliminary asteroids like i always really like this sort of big rough um sort of big viking girl because that's kind of what i think of when i think of like viking women and i felt like it would have been interesting to see that as like a teenager because it's always like oh the big scary wife or or whatever and um and then I have this quote from Simon Otto saying, we love that she's more of a lean athletic beach volleyball player as opposed to the bulky shot putting type of Viking woman. And like, my question to that is, is why? Because I feel like we have a lot of like lean athletic beach volleyball players in animation. And it just would have been interesting to have Astrid not only be like a, a big sort of uh, rough Viking girl, but for her to actually like have a personality outside of that and like be Hiccup's love interest and all that. And and I don't know, I, I see a lot of like missed opportunities happening here. Um, but who knows, maybe I'm wrong. Well, we'll find out. Um, so another unexpected sort of section of, of complaints 
was from fashion and costuming. So uh, <laughs> Meg said, when the edgy goth emo girl gains confidence and for some reason that means wearing pink and dressing really boring, dressing in really boring plain colors like Violet Parr, gaining confidence meant I bought a leather jacket and spoke up for myself. Outfit change should still reflect the character's taste. And I thought that was so smart, Meg. I don't know if you're here, but I think that's great. Um, I think this is a trope in like live action movies too, where it's like the nerdy girl has a makeover and suddenly, wow, she's beautiful. We never saw it before. Um, it's it's kind of in that same vein. Um, but yeah, I feel like I feel like the way a character dresses should always reflect on on who they are as a person. So we got a lot of comments on boys' clothing and just sort of variety of styles. Um, in seven instances of that, we had like people saying outdated, <laughs> which is something I'm beginning to notice more and more um, in in animation. And we had 14 people saying that, and then hair streak which uh, if you're here, you probably know what that is. Uh, we'll have a slide for that later. So fashion for boys. VMB uh, Rice Cake said, I'd like to see more male, male characters that clearly take care of themselves and think about their appearance without having those quali qualities relegated to just the assholes. Oh, I should also add that it would be nice if it also wasn't played for quick comedy jabs as if it was a weakness of some sort. Like Eugene gets this treatment sometimes. Eugene is a uh, Flynn Rider from, from Tangled. Um, and I think that's really interesting. And I think about that a lot actually now after doing this project is that if you have a male character who cares about his appearance and wants to look good, he is almost always either like, oh, he's gay or oh, he's an asshole, like, ooh, he's, my boyfriend spends more time in the bathroom than I do. Like, it's it's just kind of a lame stereotype that I feel like men shouldn't be discouraged from taking care of their, themselves. And um, I hope that we kind of do away with this in the coming years. And then Dracua on Twitter said, jeans and hoodie on boy leads. Generally, the lack of creativity when addressing young boy protagonists stopped the jean and hoodie plague today. Um, so I gathered some of those jean and hoodie uh, characters, and I'm kind of taking a look at them now. I personally, I don't have as much of a problem with this because, like, I wear this outfit all the time. <laughs> um, and, like, as long as what the character is wearing sort of says something about them, like, if you look at Miguel, he has these boots. I don't know. Something about those boots just have, it, it, there's like a lot of personality there. Um, Jack Frost, I don't, I don't really know how to explain away the fact that he has a hoodie. It's, I don't know. It's, it's fine, I guess. And then Hero, like all of his clothes are kind of worn and old. That just kind of looks like his comfiest hoodie that he wears all the time. And then on Walter at the end there, again, he's very like clean and all of his clothes look brand new. And he's got kind of the basic like sort of adidas shoes um so yeah i don't know there's like hints of character in each of these but i i don't know like i want i want more and i want sort of it would be nice if boys were encouraged to be fashionable and like find that part of themselves and not have to be ashamed about it so here's hair street girl um <laughs> At Rage Wang said, people can't design an East Asian female character without a colored streak in their hair. I'm so tired of it. And this is such a thing that I've been noticing lately too. And I noticed that she is a lot of times an Asian girl, but not always. Because I feel like the hair streak a lot of times is she's very edgy. She's very different. She's not like the other girls. We have Wild Style and Katy Perry Smurf and Claire from, from Troll Hunters in here. Um, but like a lot of the live action um, Asian female characters have this hair streak and it's, I don't know how to feel about it. Um, I had a friend actually talking to me about it once. She's a Korean girl. And she said, you know, the hair streak kind of bothers me because there's that old racist stereotype of like, you know, people can't tell us apart. And I was like, that's horrible. And it makes me mad now. So I don't know. I feel like hair street girls gotta go, especially like in a time now where it's trendy to just dye all of your hair a color. 
Um, so I don't know, try harder, I guess. <laughs> um, right. So the last instance, shockingly, was race and gender. So racial concerns had 21 instances of, of people kind of talking about like various instances of, of um, how they feel about how race is portrayed. And actually a lot of those overlapped with, with Hair Street Girl. Um, and then male versus female designs. A lot of these were exclusive to video games, but I put it in anyway. Um, because, you know, you have that that old thing of like the the woman character is always hot and the male character can look like various forms of monster. So if it's like the male video game character is a werewolf, he like actually looks like a wolf. And then like the female version of the werewolf is just a hot girl with ears or something. Um, so that's kind of a, a thing. And then age had nine instances. And I think that's really important, too. Um, right, so this is some research I did myself. Um, so I took the main protagonist, not the side character. So it's always just the one protagonist character of each movie that came out between 2010 and 2019 um, from Disney, DreamWorks, Pixar, Sony, Illumination, and Blue Sky. And the sort of <laughs> pie chart looks like this. Uh, the blue section you see is a white protagonist. So it's white, male or female. Um, and then the red section is non-human. <laughs> so this is like animals or uh, aliens or, or something. Um, and then for the green section, those are Asian protagonists. So I think those two were abominable and not over the moon because it hadn't come out yet. Um, I can't think of the other one. Um, but the three black characters were Into the Spider-Verse, Home, and I cannot think of the, oh, Spies in Disguise. <laughs> um, and then the Hispanic character was um, Miguel from Coco, and the indigenous character was um, Moana. I'm sorry, it's been so long since I've collected this. I'm like, I can't even remember what these movies were. Um, yeah, I think the indigenous character was Moana. Um, and then other, I'm not sure, that might have been Toy Story because like they were kind of white and non-human. So I guess it would have evened out anyway. Um, so that to me, like that's an entire generation of kids who did not see themselves really reflected in any variety of way in the media that they were watching. And uh, that's really sad to me. And I hope that, that we can make the changes here because I think it needs to be done. Um, okay, so here's something that somebody pointed out to me. Uh, and it's that a lot of these non-white protagonists have the propensity to turn into animals for most of the movie. Now, I do not think that this was done on purpose, but I think it's interesting. And I think it's something to keep in mind if you're going to make a movie with a non-white protagonist. It's like, is this character going to turn into something else and stay that way for most of the movie? I don't really know what else to say about that. It's just kind of a, a weird thing. Right, so the male versus female signs. Um, Kendall said, when men have very stylized proportions and features, well, the women are like a tracing of a photo of a woman <laughs> and posted this picture from Peter Pan, which I thought was really funny because I think this was something I detected as a child, but like couldn't really figure out what was going on here. Um, but yeah, a lot of the men were kind of caricaturized and, and different. And I mean, Captain Hook is, I mean, he's pretty much the same guy, but he's the same way. And then all the female characters are very like, semi-rotoscoped, referenced, very realistically proportioned, you know, cute women. And then when women's he heads and eyes are three times the size of men's, they look like babies, while the men look like actual people. And then I posted that family portrait from Frozen, which was spliced together. I don't think they all stood like that. But this is where I say, like, why don't either Anna or Elsa have many of their father's traits, aside from his hair color? 
I feel like I would have liked to see, you know, maybe one of them has, has like a longer face or a bigger nose or mustache. I don't know, but um, it's uh, something to think about. So standouts, this is a lot of people who, <laughs> there were a lot of people who really connected to Colette from Ratatouille. Um, uh, Anna Muter said, the male characters with the lanky body and big nose drives me nuts. And the girl is petite, but still curvy enough to be attractive, but not enough to be chubby with a cute button nose and she's sweet, but a little spunky, not too much or it's intimidating. Takes a deep breath. Colette from Ratatouille is A+. Plus. So I got a lot of people actually talking about Colette. I feel like girls that were born with like bigger noses really sort of took to her. And also Colette's kind of a badass. So I think a lot of a lot of women really wanted to see themselves in her. Um, and then Russell from Up. Uh, he, like, a lot of times in, in my early sort of, which wasn't that long ago, in my early career, people will be like, well, why does this character have to be Asian? Why does this character have to be gay? Like, why can't a character just be a little chubby Asian boy? Like, why does he need a reason to just exist? So I feel like like Russell is one of those examples where like he just is and that's fine. And he's a really beloved character and he doesn't need a reason. It, it's just, I don't know. But it's interesting because you'll see if anybody sees themselves in either of these characters, you can guarantee you're going to see, you know, 10 Russells at any Disney Halloween spectacular they have going on and i think that's beautiful um so into the spider verse was pretty widely acclaimed for having a variety of of characters in it um you know peter b parker didn't quite fit into the spider-man suit all the time it was played for laughs a couple times but he's still like a beloved character with a lot of his own personality miles of course is this black teen where we get to see his whole life and we get to you know see his family and just be with him which feels so abnormal sadly and i really hope that that there's sequels to spider-verse to be honest um and then gwen she's like she's got kind of the same sort of facial proportions and in, in look she's kind of your average pretty blonde teenage girl but she's got that alternative haircut which is kind of a funny you know bit behind that she's got an eyebrow piercing she's got a gap tooth so that's something you know that's that's still kind of interesting and then of course doc ock spoilers um she was really cool i feel like she was my favorite part of this movie because she's like this cool like hippie older woman and she's also head scientist and she's also a villain who is very cool and fights and i don't know i just i just really enjoyed her and then this is an anime but keep your hands off Aizouken. Uh, who the director is quoted as saying, like, I don't want you to draw these characters like they're girls. I want you to draw these characters like they're humans. <laughs> and I think that really brought a lot of life to the series where like, you know, I've seen a million male anime characters with, uh, you know, a lot of these faces, but female characters, not so much. And, you know, they each have their own little, little backpacks, their own little personalities. And if you haven't seen the show and you're an animator, you should definitely check it out because it's about these three girls who form a, a animation club and they and they make their own animations. And the girl on the left's a character just character animator. The girl in the middle is like concept design and the girl on the right's the producer and they just go on animation adventures and it's great. Um, Overwatch is for me a big standout. A lot of people would disagree with me. Um, but I really liked it. I really like May. Um, again, she's just a girl who's chubby. She's a scientist. She has no reason to be. She's awesome and has gun powers. <laughs> it's so stupid. She has ice gun powers and she's extremely annoying to play against sometimes if you're playing Overwatch. Um, and then Anna, who's a, she's like a 62 year old woman, I think, who's also the mother of one of the other characters. Um, she's Egyptian. She is awesome. And she, something about her that I really like is like, she can be a grandma and she can fight at the same time. And those two things don't really contradict each other. And then Sombra, who I love, um, she's got that, that alt look about her. Um, and then we have a lot of different, you know, male characters in Overwatch, a lot of different ages, a lot of different builds, a lot of different face shapes. Um, 
where it doesn't like get into over exaggeration territory unless you get to like toward yarn or something which is weird but um i don't know they still have distinctive faces to me and then here's the whole lineup of overwatch characters there's a lot of robots and i'm sure you all know about overwatch already oh so here's some artists that i consider some of my favorite character designers this is my friend samir his twitter handles right there um, I think he is a great example of being able to create these cast of characters who all look very different from each other. And they all have really distinctive facial features, but they're still very appealing in that, you know, classical sort of animation way. Like, I love Crush It. If there's any network execs here, you should pick it up. It's great. Um, <laughs> and the bottom lineup of characters, they're all part of our, our masks game, which he's the DM of, and he's great. Uh, I'll stop embarrassing him now. So this is Zachary Clarkson, who I found um, through that thread, somebody recommended him as somebody who, who does a lot of the sort of uh, classic animation, but, but different sort of proportions, especially for women character designs. And, Great Clarkson. Uh, yeah, he's great. I don't know. He's uh, I I only discovered him from doing this this um project, but it's a lot of good stuff here. Um, and then Delaney Januzzi, who I think is really cool. I just really like her work a lot. Um, and uh, she does a lot of a lot of variety of she does a variety of styles, a variety of female and male characters, and it's just very inspiring to me. And then Ana Mendez, who she has an art station, um, which I'm gonna have to find again, but I find these like 3D models of these characters super fun and super appealing. Like there's Shuri, there's Bakugo. And it's just like to show that that you can kind of make different faces and still have them like quote unquote work in 3D animation. Um, but yeah, so in conclusion, I'm going to wrap up now. Uh, mainstream animation has a social responsibility to represent all kinds of kids, because again, you know, a lot of what we see as kids is uh, going to shape our sort of perspective on the world. We should seek stories from other cultures to broaden everybody's horizons. So um, I feel like exposing the world to, you know, different cultures and, and, and different experiences is really going to really going to help everybody kind of expand and, and empathize and animation has a profound impact on kids perceptions of the world they live in and to wrap up i have some of those special characters and people who see themselves in them because i think cosplay is really neat and i feel like there's there's a lot of power in seeing a character and seeing yourself in them and i just think that's grand Anyway, that's my, my presentation. And uh, I'd like to open the floor up to questions if anybody has any. And, yeah, uh, that was amazing. Thank you for, for doing that. Of course, yeah, I hadn't done it in a while. So sorry if I stumbled. <laughs> no, that was fantastic. Uh, I guess I'll just jump into questions here. Sure. Our first question is wondering, uh, do you think that big companies like Disney, Pixar, or DreamWorks uh, have similar looking characters just because they might have a pre-built model that they use over and over again? Um, I can't really speak to this. Again, I've only been in feature for um, a little bit, like a little over a year. And I don't really know much about the modeling and actual animation aspect of it. So I can't confirm or deny uh, any of that. But my guess would be is that it's more of a more of a like this kind of formula worked before, so we should do it again. And I feel like most of it's unconscious too. Like I feel like if you're gonna make a princess, you automatically think of like the normal princess look. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I think it's kind of fair to point out you showed us uh, one of your friends who's like a 3D modeler who can design different kinds of characters. And if they can do it independently, I'm pretty sure a studio like Disney could do it. Yeah, really cool. Uh, this next question is asking, why do you think studios don't risk creating por uh, protagonists that don't fit the quote unquote norm? You know, I'd, again, 
um, since I've only been in feature for a short amount of time and at Skydance, we're really, really, we're really pushing to, to make different protagonists and different um, characters, but it's, I feel like a lot of it is kind of an internal bias that you have. Like you've only seen this type of character, so you only continue to, to make those kind of characters and you only think that these ones look good. You only think these ones are gonna be relatable. I I can't speak for like studio execs. I can't speak for the, the businessy folks. Um, I know there's like marketing, like merchandising concerns, um, but I'm, from where I'm standing, I am seeing a sort of shift in, in that, a sort of at least trying and, and keeping in mind that there is a lot of the same stuff going around and that there does need to be kind of a shift. And I think that that's sort of a positive flag. <laughs> Kind of reading the chat so um let's see i'm gonna jump to another question here uh da -da -da. this person's asking is it all right to maintain some sort of traditions with design even when experimenting with more variety i think so um i don't think i'm not here to like tear down everything you learned in character design class and at CalArts or whatever um, I think there is something to it. Like, I don't know, we, we always learn that, you know, round things are, are our friends and pointy things are our enemies. And I feel like, I feel like there's a way to keep that in mind while still kind of trying to push in a different direction. Again, I'm not a, like a professional character designer. Um, it's, it's interesting because like in, in art school, they'll always tell you like you need to learn the rules before you can break them. So I think like learning your, your taking your basic like character design 101 class would always be beneficial because um, there are like principles that are, are useful in, um, in designing like universally. But yeah, I guess, I guess learning the rules before you break them and then kind of like pushing for that is probably the best advice I'd have. Do you feel like there's a uh, character design cliches in TV as well? Oh, absolutely. I do. <laughs> um, I just kept it to, to feature because I wanted to like, like there's so much in TV right now. There's so much content coming out. Um, I do, I again, see a lot of the like funny fat dude uh, cliche in TV a lot. And, um, and you know, I don't know. The, I feel like there's, there's sort of, just tropes in general, like not even just TV animation, but like character tropes that are like, they don't necessarily have to be like harmful to society, but just kind of like tired. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I feel like it's, it's just something to keep in mind when creating characters is like, cause, cause it, Oftentimes, like when I'm creating a character, I'll often like, you know, for D&D &D or when I'm pitching it to, to somebody at Skydance or whatever, it'll be something like, oh, I really like um, this type of character. I'll, I'll kind of think about this character while I'm making it and then go off of the things that are happening in the story to make it different from like the character that I was thinking about when I created it. And it'll often like grow and change. Um, I don't know. I guess just just being aware of it is is useful. Uh, this might kind of go into this. Uh, do you have any like exercises or practices to try to learn how to draw different looking characters? Um. Again, I. <laughs> it's funny because like I'm a storyboard artist, so all of my drawings are really quick and dirty, like like really fast sort of sort of drawings. But I. I think my advice would be just kind of like look at and, and during the presentation I gave to Skydance, it was like, if you need inspiration on, you know, finding like a direction to take a character in, just like, you know, look at the zoom screen we had screen, the zoom screen we had was just full of all of these, you know, 
different faces, you know, people of different ages and, and, you know, ethnicities and just had different facial features. And it's just like, they're all, <laughs> sounds super cheesy to say, they're all beautiful. Um, but it's just, it's just kind of like looking, drawing from real life, I think, and figuring out how to incorporate those things into appealing character designs. Um, and that can have a lot to do with kind of just drawing from life to begin with. Uh, someone's asking, where do you feel like white coated non-human characters, like the ones from Onward fall into your pie chart? Oh, Onward. Well, I didn't put Onward in there because I only did it up till 2019. Um, I think it still has an effect on, on, you know, the, the stuff we see. And it's hard to say because like, I don't know, just what's an animal movie? that I like Lion King, Lion King, I guess. Like, I don't, I don't know much about like race coding um, other than what I can see, but, and you know, I'm, I'm only living by my own sort of white female experiences. Um, I think I, I only made the pie chart that way to give a really clear sort of visual on like how often I think it's just it's just weird that we have so many more instances of like non-human characters than we have of like non-white characters. It just seems, I don't know, it, it's, it's just, it's interesting to me. Um, but yeah, I don't know, I can only, I can only really speak from my personal experiences there, I think. Yeah, I mean, I agree that it's interesting. I think I've seen similar charts comparing the same things, but like in children's books. Yeah, you mean like, yeah, I guess I'd, I don't have as much insight on like, like illustration or, or kids books or whatever, but I feel like it's probably pretty universal for all media, especially kids media. All right, so this next question's uh, talking about how you were showing a lot of the, um, the pre-development, the pre-vis art, and they're saying we see a lot of more interesting designs uh, why do you think it's getting watered down at towards the end? Is there some sort of reason do you believe for that? Um, it's, it's hard to say. Um, I know that, again, I'll, I'll reiterate, like I haven't been in feature very long, so I haven't seen much of this process unfold before my eyes. Um, but, you know, we'll go through a lot of, a lot of different designers and take a lot of their different takes on the characters. And, you know, we also have, um, you know, the studio's opinions coming in and, and just, you know, executive stuff. Like, it's all, I don't want to blame anybody and I don't want to, like, throw anybody under the bus or say that people aren't trying hard enough or it's all, like, corporate greed or whatever. But I, it, it's a lot of people and I think it's the same when, when, like, say, a story in general feels kind of watered down. It's just, like, it's a lot of cooks in the kitchen, maybe. Um, that's just my theory. Um, and then just kind of going with the most like universally appealing one. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's about it. Uh, this next person's asking, who's your favorite character from a recent uh, feature or TV show that you think uh, the emo that's mostly because of their design or their personality? <laughs> um, this is gonna go, totally against like everything that I just did, but I really, really enjoyed Ellie uh, in The Last of Us 2. Controversial opinion, I know, but uh, <laughs> she, I mean, when we're talking about seeing ourselves in, in characters, um, I feel like Ellie, and, and this is getting off of the, the sort of design aspect of it, is that I feel like there's a very certain uh, there are certain parameters of like femininity and even masculinity in media in general that there's like lines that we're afraid to cross. Um, and Ellie for one is that kind of example of like a really, really sort of like tomboyish. And I mean, she's gay, I'm gay. Uh, you know, she's, she doesn't like dress girly, you know, she, she's, 
her design, I feel like, is a product of her environment. So she's just like taking clothes from wherever she can find them, of course. And and she's like, <laughs> I watched this one reviewer on YouTuber saying like, oh, she can't stop talking like Batman for two seconds. And it's like, if she was a male character, like the story would still be the same. It's just, uh, it's it's interesting. Um, so I feel like for me, it, it's been Ellie because I think like I could really, I could really see myself in her in terms of like, her sort of um, girl tomboyishness slash just being gay um, slash being a badass and like kind of wishing I was that badass. So, yeah. And just to clarify from someone in the comments, it's Ellie from the game, The Last of Us. Ellie too. from the game, The Last of Us too. Yeah. I'm um, also a big fan of Hiccup from How to Train Your Dragon. Like, that's one of my favorite animated movies ever, so. Is that why you didn't put him in the Linguini lineup? <laughs> that's what I said. I have that personal bias of like, oh, I don't want to put Hiccup in here. Because, yeah, he's great. But first Hiccup, I think first Hiccup is my favorite. The first movie is my favorite. Yeah. It, you talked a lot about, well, specifically about M American animation from the last decade. Um, have you looked into animation from other countries? Do you feel like they have similar design tendencies? Interesting because, so I grew up on anime and I think it has a, like a big influence on, <laughs> cause I'm also kind of working on putting together a presentation for anime in general for um, some of my colleagues. Um, anime is really interesting because for one, all of those like sort of female characters that I wanted to see in my media when I was a kid were in like Sailor Moon or, you know, a lot of the anime that I got to watch when I was a kid. Cause I feel like they're less, at least <laughs> it's hard because it goes both ways because I feel like there was definitely more LGBT sort of representation in anime, at least from when I was a kid. Um, but at the same time, they are very, like, there's always that character in every shonen anime that's, like, a perv and who, like, gropes girls. And it's just, like, that's another one of those, like, really, maybe it was kind of funny the first time in, like, 1986 or whatever, but it's just kind of tired and annoying now. Um, I'm talking about Mineta, Mineta from <laughs> My Hero Academia. Um it's it's really interesting because something like anime is very like it's kind of like you can't really put it in a box anywhere or say that it is better than us or worse than us because they have just as much of a variety of like uh genres and, and sort of archetypes so i guess that's my vague answer for that yeah i think we have a lot of people in the chat that are excited for that anime talk <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe next year at CTN. No, I'll put it together. I should start a YouTube channel. Maybe I should just talk about my opinions. Yeah, give us a YouTube channel. Give us all your hot takes. Oh, God. <laughs> I don't know if I want to do that, but <laughs> yeah. I, speaking of hot takes, mm -hmm. uh, we got a question here in the Q&A asking about uh, the quote-unquote CalArts style. Mm. Do you feel like that is a, a something people need to look out for in TV animation? And why do you think it's a thing? So <laughs> this is going to be a hot take for sure. Um, I feel like it's weird because when you say Cal art style, I immediately know what you're talking about, but I don't know that it's all necessarily like from Cal arts. So I wouldn't know if you would call it the Cal arts style. I know it is a style. Um, it is, I just kind of feel like if you look back on, on animation as a whole, like in, in past decades, there is kind of like a general vibe to shows from different studios and, you know, different uh, areas and whatever. And they all kind of have a similar look, like in the eighties, if you have all the like sort of GI Joe looking dudes and the He-Mans and whatever. And then like, you know, in the sort of Dexter's lab era, you have kind of like sort of graphic sort of flat characters. And it, it's weird. It, my opinions on CalArt style are that 
a style does exist. I don't necessarily think it's bad. It's not my preferred style. But I also think it's just like the, a product of the time. You know what I mean? Is that a soft enough take? <laughs> That's the, that's the <laughs> safest take you could take. No, I'm, no, that's a really good take. Um, Thank you. <laughs> someone's asking, after finding all these problems and sort of like doing this kind of deep dive into it, does that make you want to go into character design? <laughs> um, I'm gonna be honest. I feel like I don't have the technical skills for that. I feel like I don't have the sort of graphic, um, I feel like I don't have the, I think that my talents lie in storyboarding because I don't like to finish drawings. So <laughs> I like to do more of the actual like story stuff, which feels weird because I don't like to be that guy that's like, well, I can't do that, but I'm gonna tell you how to do that. But I don't know, I don't know. It's hard, it's hard to say because I don't really wanna be, I feel like I could like <laughs> design an interesting character and then like give it to a character designer to make it better, <laughs> if that makes sense. Do um, you ever find yourself like sneaking in a little bit of like design changes in your shorthand when you're like storyboarding? A little bit, a little bit. Um, a lot of the shows, well, both shows that I have worked on that are currently out are like, uh, they're puppeted shows. So none of that really probably made it through, but um, yeah, I don't know. It's uh, it's interesting because like when you look at a show like Steven Universe, for example, like you can often tell like which storyboard artist did which episode because like a little of that style like leaks into it, which like personally I think is really cool. And there's a lot of that in older cartoons too. Um, yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't like completely change a character or anything, but like, um, yeah, I guess. Could just like completely go off model. <laughs> Yeah, right. I'm like, this is a different character now. He's wearing a cooler outfit. <laughs> He's not wearing a hoodie and jeans. <laughs> right. It's hard for me to go off on the hoodie and jeans because like that's a an animation staple. I mean, for people who work in animation, <laughs> wear that outfit, uh, including myself. Uh, we got a comment in here, not really a question, but they just want to let you know how great this was. Uh, Aww. And, it's, they, and they say great again. It's been so great and thoughtful. So they just wanted me to let you know that. Well, thanks. I'm glad. I'm glad you could get something out of it. I'm. I try really hard to be like unbiased. Um, so I don't know. I hope everybody could kind of kind of get something out of it in a in a way that was constructive. Yeah. This next person is asking, how often do you get the chance to delve into this sort of uh, studying side of animation into your work? Uh, do you put together presentations um, like this often? <laughs> uh, I have, Skydance has been a really, really cool place to work and I'm not like shilling just to shill here, but um, coming from TV, and I'll tell people this all the time, like I came from TV, which is very much like you storyboard an episode in, you know, six to eight weeks, you move on to the next episode, you're just constantly going, you don't really have any impact on the script or the story or any of that stuff. You just do the story. So <laughs> coming to Skydance and, and starting to work in feature, um, it was wild to like have an impact on that stuff. And it was crazy to like sit in this room with all of these animation legends, like all the people at Skydance like came from Disney. <laughs> so it's like, I've seen like you storyboarded a scene that really impacted me when I was a kid, like that's crazy. And then say things about the story and have them listen to me is like bonkers. So I think in general, just, just being listened to is really cool. But then when like John and Heather gave me the opportunity to like, they were like, hey, like, do you wanna, you know, cause originally I was just gonna show them, but then they were like, you should do this for the whole studio. Um, so <laughs> I have, had a, I have a couple things that I'm working on right now as research projects. Um, for a while there, I was doing all just a lot of boarding, um, so I didn't really have time to do the extra side stuff. But I do kind of have the opportunity to 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 do these things. Um, I guess whenever I have time, 
which has been which has been fun and uh I don't know. It, it's cool because I feel very much like I'm coming in and being like, look at all the stuff I learned on the internet. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. It's It's been cool. It's kind of yeah, a long we, answer. We got a couple comments saying that they would love to see a YouTube channel filled with video <laughs> essays from you. Oh, God. Okay. Well, maybe I will. I have to get a better camera than this, but <laughs> I'll do one of those like animated avatar channels. Uh, like we're like one of those uh <laughs> yeah where they cross their arms yeah yeah <laughs> well, just like... <laughs> or a vtuber <laughs> that's what i was about to say yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i'm working on it <laughs> don't be like mr andrew okay <laughs> <laughs> no, i want to be like corona all the cute anime girl will do all the talking for me or something uh this next question is wondering what are your thoughts on designing characters that uh, look separately from their personalities to get away from cliche types. I think that's really cool. I think one of the comments that was in the, the presentation said something like, I don't think that the design has to reflect who the character is. And I think there's some truth to that in that I feel like how you're born and what you look like doesn't really have an impact on that, but like your clothes and like how you present yourself probably should have more to do with the character's personality and the character's background than like the traits they were born with. Um, but yeah, I guess that's that's kind of how I would answer that. This might be an interesting follow-up question. And I know you said you're not an actual character designer, but um, you hear a lot about like readability when it comes to animation. Like mm -hmm. you want things to read instantly. Um, do you think like that might be why some of these tropes are done and do you think it's smart to not follow that trope, even if you lose readability? Because when I think of readability, I think of like silhouette and like, you know, I can instantly recognize this character from across the room or, or that stuff. Um, I don't think readability is, is necessarily like, if you're talking about like, oh, I see a fat character and I feel like this character has a lack of self-control or something. Like, I feel like that's a stereotype that that isn't really great. And I don't think that's like, that's not something I wanna read from a character. You know what I mean? Um, so, and it's hard because like when you have a villain, like they, they can be really, you know, skinny and they have like a pointy nose and like a thin face and are an old woman or something. And it's, it's hard to, I don't know. I feel like it's something you kind of have to play by ear because like, I feel like almost just taking inspiration from like your real life friends. Like how many friends do you know that are like, how many goth friends do you have that are actually going around? Like nothing really matters and whatever. Um, or I don't know. It's, it's just people who look different do have different personalities. So I guess I would kind of go with with that, it's not really an answer, I don't think, but um, that's, I guess, my thoughts on it. Oh, I, I appreciate that you're saying, you know, think about it at least. Think <laughs> about what, what you're saying when you're drawing a character. Yeah. What you're trying to convey. <laughs> um, I'm reading some of the people. Hmm. Oh. Uh, I see a question in the chat that says, I think people of other art departments should have some kind of critique or input like with, wait, I lost it. Moon Girl and how none of the board artists, character designers or writers were POC. Kind of a gray area, I don't know. Okay, so for that, that's actually interesting because we talk about that a lot at Skydance. First of all, I know several story artists on Moon Girl that are, that are people of color. Um, so I don't know where that information came from, but at Skydance, we have, um, I don't know if this is like divulging like the inner workings of the studio and I'm not supposed to, but everybody is kind of welcome to give their opinion on anything. So we'll have like community character reviews. Will there show like the main character of a movie and anybody can just say how they feel, um, about how this person is represented visually. Um, 
so that's been really useful because like say you know if we don't have any black character designers but we have black storyboard artists like i'm sure they would be 100 percent welcome to like give their input on those things um and it is hard because uh a whole nother issue is kind of diversity within actual the, the actual creation of animation which is another thing that i feel like we're shifting towards being better at um so yeah i don't know i feel like for me it's like if story-wise if a character is going through an experience that is like something that's very like nuanced cultural experiences that you should definitely have somebody like checking you on that um i don't know just for the sake of like authenticity and for the people who are watching this who relate to this character like are they really gonna see themselves in the character like are they really gonna relate to those you know cultural differences those cultural nuances um yeah i don't know it's it's nice to feel like if it's you making something i feel like getting as much feedback from other people from different perspectives is always kind of nice to have Uh, we have a question from someone asking if you could maybe show again the um, artists that you were showing earlier that you felt like had a very good. Yes. Okay. So I don't know all of them personally. I will say that. Um, I know a couple of them, but they're just kind of people who like really inspire me. So it's kind of embarrassing to be like, look how great these people are. Um, right. This is Samir. Oh, shit. Sorry, I swore. Um, yeah, so you can flip through these if you want. Um, I know his Twitter handle because we are friends. He works on Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur, actually, so. Um, then we have Zachary, who I was only able to find his online portfolio, so I don't know if he has a Twitter handle. Um, it's one of those people that I don't know, so it's kind of weird to be like, I really love his art so much that I'm putting it in this presentation, but there we go. He's, he's going to find out and yeah. he's going <laughs> to be like, who are you? Send you a DMCA takedown or something. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I won't put it on YouTube, I swear. Um, and Delaney, who I do, sorry, we're, we're Twitter mutuals. I hope she doesn't think I'm super weird. I did commission her for something one time, so... <laughs> um wait she has she does have a twitter and an instagram which i can find it is i don't know why i didn't put twitter handles on all of these oh it's just at delaney Genuzzi, which is on the screen and then yeah anna mendez i also don't know her personally but i'm a big fan <laughs> I remember seeing um, this bottom left sort of character design and I was like, that's so cool. Like, what is this gonna be in? And then it was, you know, she was just like, oh, this is just my, my cool stuff that I do on the side. And I'm like, dang. Um, yeah, that's a lot. I mean, there's plenty more that I could throw in. Um, but these were just kind of my, you know, for the sake of this presentation, like my faves. Go back to seniors page. Yeah. Any other cues? Yeah, if you're comfortable with it, we got a couple questions asking if you could talk a little bit about your journey into feature animation. Oh, okay. Yeah, I totally could. Um, I guess I should probably start with like my journey into animation in general, um, which is that I graduated from a school. <laughs> and did not find a job because that school was not um, as helpful as say CalArts because luckily, oh my gosh. So I went to CalArts um, coming from a school that didn't totally want to help its students actually find jobs afterwards. Um, and when I started working at Sky Skydance, we went to CalArts Portfolio Day and I was just like, wait, okay. So every single student gets a table like every student gets to put their work out for 
people who are actually looking to hire people will come and look at their portfolios and you can just put it out there. Like, I don't know. It's, it, it was mind blowing to me, by the way, you don't have to go to art school to get a job in art. I will just say that. Um, so after I graduated, I did, <laughs> I was like, I can't pay for my student loans. So I'm going to go to grad school to put those off a little bit more, which is never a good idea. So part of this is my fault. Um, so I went to like a quarter of grad school and I applied for the DreamWorks Story Initiative and I got a test, which was my first ever storyboard test. And I took the test and it did not get accepted, <laughs> which was sad. But by then I was like, I'm sick of this. I don't want to be a student anymore. Uh, I want to move to LA. So my wife, who's my girlfriend at the time, uh also was kind of in the same mindset of like I don't want to like hang around here anymore so what we did was like neither of us uh, I mean we both have parents who are, who are very nice but neither of them could like support us financially so uh, I signed up for another quarter of grad school got my student loan reimbursement uh had a yard sale and used all that money to travel to Los Angeles <laughs> Um, so, uh, don't do that, but that's how I did it. And then we found a really cheap place, which was my, one of my cool professors, which by the way, the school I went to had really great professors. Um, the business itself was a little skeezy. So one of the professors had a sister who lived out here and she had like one of those little, what do they call them? Like granny flats or like in-law houses we lived in there um so that was really cool because we got to like save money we struggled for like a year or two maybe um and then we so the the ladies we lived on their on their house with you know i don't know if any of you have parents who are like you know my my friends daughter works in on cartoons like you should really meet her and you know the daughter is like you know works in a completely different field than you and you're like thanks mom that's really cool so um we got one of those leads where she was like oh this this woman i worked with like to buy her house like she works in cartoons and here's her phone number and we're like oh my gosh thanks you know thinking it's not going to go anywhere um and then she was she worked on the powerpuff girls reboot and she was super cool and super nice and she was like, hey, we need storyboard revisionists like today. Can you come in? And we're like, oh my God. So that was how we got our first jobs in animation, both Sophie and I. Um, and then from there, we worked freelance as storyboard revisionists for a couple months. And then I went to DreamWorks, Sophia went to Hasbro. And then from DreamWorks, I worked there for like six months before I got my job in Tangled. And then Tangled was really good for building up my portfolio for like a feature future <laughs> because it was a very sort of cinematic show i get to storyboard alan menken songs which was like a dream come true at like the very beginning of my career which was awesome i put all that in my portfolio and uh that actually was what got me looked at at skydance so um yeah <laughs> that was a really long-winded way and kind of petty towards my school to um say that it was a little bit of a struggle, but I, I think that once you're, once you sort of start working and like develop kind of a reputation, you, you know, you build up your work, you can kind of like, you know, decide where to go. As long as you're like a cool guy and you don't have like, you're not mean to people, <laughs> like you just, just make those connections and, and go places and, and Find out where you want to go and it's a lot easier to to kind of like direct yourself once you're kind of surrounded by other people who have all these different experiences that they're willing to share with you and it's just yeah it's cool yeah that was great <laughs> that wasn't petty towards your school at all either i think <laughs> i think a lot of people need to hear that you don't need to go to art school because you really don't need to go to art school please don't go to art school especially <laughs> if you have to pay for all of it yourself because yeah it's, it, it's really funny i think um where it looks like a lot of different people were guessing different schools. <laughs> as to where I saw you a went. couple correct answers. Ooh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, what do you what do you have any 
like, do you have any tips for networking once you're like in the area or even now that everything's online? Yeah, you know, um, it's crazy because there's a couple of friends that I like met online that I, I like recommended for jobs and they got them. So <laughs> it's hard because like you kind of have the power to recommend people, but also you can recommend people and they're like, great, thanks. And then you never hear from them again. And it's usually not having to do with like the talent of the person that you're recommending. It's usually just some weird thing. Like they already had somebody that they were thinking of or somebody else's friend or it just wasn't the right style for that exact moment. Um, so I don't know. I think it's just like being a genuine person, like being genuinely like nice and interested in what people have to say. Um, I'm personally not the best at networking online like I have friends who will just like comment on everybody's stuff and just suddenly be friends with everyone it's it's hard like it's it's kind of like a, a personal thing I feel like that you that you um kind of find your way into but I feel like if you're like personally networking with people so like me people who went to my school who I'm like I know that you're not getting any help from the school. So like hit me up if you're in LA, which they did when we could meet in person. Um, and, you know, I've had lunch with a couple of people and just kind of like talk to them about stuff. Like if you know somebody out here, just like meet up and have coffee and talk about stuff. And then like, maybe you'll, you know, come up in their mind. Maybe there's like a job that this person is going to come across and be like, oh my gosh, that would be a great like position for this person that I met. You know, maybe you should give them a test. Um, so I don't know. I guess it's just kind of like <laughs> the basic guide to networking is just kind of being nice, um, not being pushy, making genuine connections. You know, I think even your peers, like before you're even working, like people you went to school with, your friends on the internet who also want to be in animation, like those people are going to be invaluable to you so like even if they're not working now being close to them like it's kind of like holding the door open you know because you know um <laughs> shameless plug my wife's show onyx equinox is coming out on november 21st on crunchyroll and uh so she was was fortunate enough to like pitch her show at the right place at the right time um and uh crunchyroll was a brand new studio and it was very small and she, like, we knew all these people from school who were really, really good at their jobs. Like, they were really good at stuff, but they'd just never gotten to land a job in the industry. So we were like, dude, come paint backgrounds for us. Come, you know, you know, be a, a production person. Like, it's just kind of like, those genuine connections are the ones that are going to take you places because... I don't know. It, it's always, it's always like a friend of a friend that, that, you know, helps you out. And then once you're there, just kind of be nice to your friends. I guess. That's amazing. I think it's kind of similar to some other advice I've heard, which is like uh, your future coworkers aren't necessarily going to be your professors, but they're going to be your peers. Yeah, exactly. It's a big we're, thing. Uh, we're getting close to the end of our time here. Uh, before I, Thank you profusely and let you go. Uh, where can we find you on social media to find more of your art? Oh, geez. Um, so I have an Instagram and a Twitter. Um, my Twitter is just a lot of memes right now, but it is at banana bread, B-A-N-A-N-N-E-R-B-R-E-A-D. Um, so that is my regular Twitter, which I'm mostly on. And then, although I do have, a, I hate to be like a buzzkill here, but a lot of times I, I don't always get notifications from people who aren't mutuals with me only because like, I don't know, people, sometimes weird things happen. So I try to keep it to like people I know personally. Um, and then I have an Instagram, uh, which is banana sandwich. B-A-N-A-N-N-E-R-S-A-N-D-W-I-C-H. That's where I post my art. Awesome. Thank you. So hopefully everyone will be able to like just go check out more of your work and some more of your hot takes. Oh god. <laughs> <laughs>
I try not to post hot takes online, to be honest. But maybe I'll make that YouTube channel. Yeah, we need that YouTube channel. <laughs> well, thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, I will um, I'll try to keep my takes uh, as spiritual as possible. Cringe. <laughs> Who's cringing? <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming, and thank you everyone for all of your fantastic questions. Great, uh, really, really insightful look into uh, same face syndrome <laughs> into <laughs> Laguini face. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I appreciate it, and uh, yeah, it's been fun. All right. All right, thank you again. Bye. Thanks.